Hello, everyone, and welcome to this mini series on modeling developmental systems. Uh, small and short and brief and simple explanation of why we need to model to understand developmental processes. I have about two hours to introduce a topic that takes several semesters of lectures usually. So what we're doing here is clearly mission impossible. It's gonna be very condensed. It's gonna be very superficial. It's gonna be very broad. So fasten your seatbelt for a little introduction. What I want you to sort of get out of this is not expertise in how to model a developmental process, a developmental system. But I want to sort of instill in you this sort of understanding why it's a good thing to model. So as an experimentalist, as a maybe a bioinformatician, so that you can go and, and find sort of the, the colleagues in your department that can do the modeling for you, can understand what the purpose of modeling is, what it can and what it cannot do. So it's gonna stay at this very sort of conceptual level, high level, and I'm trying not to be very technical. The strategy is to sort of introduce the general purpose of modeling in this first lecture, and then provide two examples of what I think are really successful and illustrative um, cases of where modeling was used to do something that you couldn't achieve with sort of molecular and genetic experimental work alone. So this lecture is gonna be busy with the, the question, why? Why should anyone model? Of course, Nowadays, it's good to have a model in your paper because that increases the um, likelihood of it getting accepted by editors, but that's not the point. And often these models that are just added on top of some experimental work don't add anything to the understanding of the developmental process under study. So basically, what I want you uh, to understand here is when do we need to model and what does that get you? that you cannot get with experiments alone. So we do not just want to have a model because it's fancy. We want to model only when it's necessary and when it's beneficial and when it contributes to sort, some sort of explanation or understanding of a developmental process. The way I would like to frame it, because I am coming from the field of evolutionary developmental biology, I would like to see development as the sort of process that mediates between the genotype and the phenotype. So in my head, I, I contextualize development in terms of the genotype phenotype map, which is what maps variation at the genetic level to phenotypic variation, which is ultimately what population processes such as selection um, work on. This is where the variation occurs. Uh, the variant phenotypes that are being selected. And of course, this is just a sort of a, a thinking help. It's not very realistic. In reality, uh, animals are actually phenotype to phenotype maps, right? So you go from one generation to another generation that resemble each other. <clears throat> but it's helpful nonetheless, if you sort of consider that it's a cartoon and also that there's some additional factors here, um, you have an organismic and external environment that contributes sort of tissue level factors, environmental triggers that contribute to this mapping. It's, it's not a closed mapping in this sense. And also you will notice that in the drawing, I, I'm showing you here several different genotypes sometimes map to the same phenotype here. And that is of course, robustness, canalization or resilience of development. While sometimes the same genotype can map to different phenotype under different environmental conditions. And this is called developmental plasticity. So there's a whole lot that goes into this very simple picture, but it's, it's nevertheless good to structure your thought. This is the main task. We want to understand how genetic variation maps onto phenotypic variation. Um, the structure of this highly complex and degenerate map determines the variational properties and hence the evolvability of the development system. This is my own per personal uh, interest, but I, I would like to make an argument not only that modeling is important to understand development, but also the comparative analysis of developmental processes. We'll come to that 
later. What's really important here is that you can interpret the mathematical structure of a map in two very different ways. So this sort of um, mapping here, it's also called a morphism in mathematics, um, could be a correlation. So we could just be measuring genotypic variation and correlated to phenotypic variation. This is what, uh, for example, quantitative genetics does. But development, of course, looks at this map in a clearly different way, a more mechanistic way. We're going to try and understand what it means to explain this map in a me mechanistic sense. And so what is really hidden here is not a correlation, but sort of a causal process. Okay, so we want, we don't want just correlational explanations, but we want a causal mechanistic explanation of this map. And then we need to realize that what's hidden behind this very abstract formulation um, is a process, of course, very beautifully illustrated by uh, Conrad Howe Waddington's epigenetic landscape. And I'm showing you a, a rather less well-known example, <clears throat> an illustration of his landscape here, where you can see uh, <clears throat> two little X-shaped sort of shapes here and then different valleys that lead to different tissue types <clears throat> or even regionalizations in the embryo. So you can build a thorax, a wing, different kinds of leg parts, antennae, mouth. And what is represented in this landscape is a trajectory. Okay, so this, this sort of visual metaphor that Waddington is presenting here is not an exact model. It remains at a meta metaphorical level. It's very powerful exactly because of that. The visualization is very compelling. And also the formulation is sufficiently vague so you can actually adopt this um, picture to many, many different contexts. Just think about it. What are the different axes here? So uh, this sort of uh, depth axis here is time. Of course, time flows downward. But it, then it gets more difficult if you think about the height or sort of this x-axis here. What, what is the difference between those different um, fates? And also, if you think about it a little more, why are these sort of balls that are rolling down or egg shapes that are rolling down the landscape, why are they separate from the landscape itself? What do they represent? Do they represent a cell, a tissue, an organism? It's not clear. So this is both the power and the limitation. The genius of Waddington was to not explain exactly what he meant by this picture. So everybody can adopt it to its, their own purposes. But on the other hand, this is not a precise model of development. What it tells us and what the power of a metaphor like this is that is, is what we need to understand is not a thing, okay? It's a process. And, and Waddington called these developmental processes the process of rolling down the valley. He called it a creode. This is a word that's no longer in use, so we will call it a developmental trajectory. We need to explain the shape and the dynamics of this sort of trajectory here. That is our task, and this is where modeling becomes crucially important. So let's, let's have a sort of a historical look at, at how do we explain these trajectories historically. And we could arbitrarily start maybe in the 1970s when, when people were starting um, to describe developmental genes. And, and in particular, they were discovering Hox genes and found out that they're active in all animals. They're active in um, the specification of whole body regions. And if you actually mutate one of these Hox genes, you switch the identity of one body part into the identity of another. So the first um, view, the first type of explanation for these trajectories is the genes act as sort of switches that put you in one of these valleys or another. So development is just sort of a sequence of switches, one switch after the other. And what were called selector genes, like the Hox genes, were, were executing those switches between the valley. Okay, that's, that's uh, fair enough for the, the sort of, uh, knowledge at the time. So what I'm showing you here is a beautiful study by uh, Michalis Averov and Michael Aiken um, on the identity of different uh, uh, arthropod segments and how they correspond to the rearrangement of different Hox domains. But it leaves many, many things, many 
answers open. For example, what so you 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 now know how you switch from one one valley to the other, but the shape, the exact shape of each of the valleys is not clear yet. So let's move forward and, and develop this, this sort of type of explanation a little for, uh, uh, further. And um, throughout this lecture, I'm going to talk a lot about one of my favorite animals here. This is a vinegar fly, not a fruit fly. Fruit flies, parasites, fruit, tephritic flies, like the, the med fly in California. This is Drosophila melanogaster, of course. Um, one of the most commonly used model systems. So this lecture is aimed at sort of early stage PhD students. So you're probably familiar um, with the animal. We're gonna use the segmentation gene system that creates the beautiful segmented body plan visible here in the afternoon. And by the fact that different appendages are, are, are attached to different thoracic segments here. Uh, we're gonna look at that um, as our example system. So, here is the uh, segmentation gene system of Drosophila mel melanogaster. Very brief sort of uh, just reminder. Um, it's active during the blastoderm stage of development during the first three hours of development when the embryo is a syncytium. Um, there are nuclear divisions, but there are no membranes yet between the different nuclei. Um, and the nuclei migrate from the center of the embryo to uh, the periphery where they form the blastoderm is visible beautifully here. Um, the advantage of this embryo is, is, is obviously that it's, it's developing very fast. We're looking at here about one and a half hours of uh, developmental time. And also there is no growth or sort of uh, cellular rearrangement involved. So what's happening is that you can have um, transcription factors expressed that diffuse through the embryo and directly regulate each other's expression in this spatial temporal context. It's very simple. And this is great to study um, pattern formation because you can focus when you have a mutant of one of these um, factors, segmentation genes, um, the only effect it has before gastrulation is that it affects the expression of other genes, no other morphological or any other effect. So a very simple developmental system, that's its, its basic power. And you have this cascade of maternal coordinate genes, such as BigQuig, which is shown here, RNA localized at the interior of the embryo, then the protein is translated and diffuses through the embryo. You can see the single nuclei here and the different concentrations of this transcription factor in the nuclei. Posterior gradient of caudal and then a second anterior gradient of hunchback. And these maternal coordinate genes activate uh, the transcription, uh, transcription, you know, encode transcription factors that activate uh, uh, at a first step the gap genes, hunchback, croupal, uh, shown here in the middle of the embryo, Knurps, giant tailors, and Huckabine, and these genes are expressed in these sort of broad overlapping domains. Together, the maternal coordinate genes and the gap genes regulate uh, the parallel genes, the first sort of periodic expression pattern here, seven stripes, even skipped odd, skipped hairy, run, fushi, terazu, and paired are examples of parallel genes. And all of those together finally regulate the expression of the segment polarity genes, in particular, engrailed and wingless, which mutually inhibit each other and form these sort of um, parasegmental uh, boundaries, that have a, a pre-pattern, a molecular pre-pattern that reflects the formation of the segments later on. And you can see this is already after gastrulation, the embryo has wrapped around the posterior is now here, the interior is here, and you get 14 stripes um, in this molecular pre-pattern. This is a classic, of course, um, system, and, and we know a lot um, about uh, the genes, their interactions, and also sort of the principle by which it works. And for years and years, it was thought to be this sort of French flag patterning system. So Bigquid is a classical morphogen. So it was sort of the discovery of Bigquid and its expression pattern was a triumph because it confirmed a model that was formulated by Louis Walbert uh, much earlier in 1968 and 1969, in which he said, um, he wanted, so Walbert's idea was to, to refocus uh, the, the sort of attention of developmental biologists from um, temporal gene regulation, which came from Jacot's and Monod's um, paradigmatic example of the lack opera. Walbert wanted to refocus our attention back to spatial, um, problems of spatial pattern generation. And what he did is uh, he assumed a very simple sort of situation in which you have a tissue, there's a source 
um, of a substance called morph a morphogen on one end of the tissue and a sink at the other end. And if you have no degradation uh, in between, what you get and no production of the morphogen in between, what you get is a linear gradient. So this sort of linearly um, decreasing slope of morphogen concentration across the tissue. You can then imagine, um, so this is sort of the first step development in Walbert's model is fundamentally seen as a two-step process. In this first step, um, the cells in the tissue uh, can sense different concentration thresholds. Here is one. Here is one in that morphogen gradient. And they will then, in a second step, the differentiation step, um, uh, switch on different target genes, which are represented by the different colors, blue, white, and red here. And that forms, uh, of course, the French flag. What is very important in this very simple, um, this is a model of development. It's um, uh, a static model, but uh, it's a cartoon model, but uh, it's, it's a, a very strong tool, um, thinking tool, that influenced um, generations of developmental biologists who were looking to try and identify different morphogens in different developmental systems uh, based on the prediction that you should be uh, finding those. What's important here in this very simple model, morphogen thresholds correspond exactly to where the target domain boundaries will lie in the tissue later on. And in this way, the morphogen gradient can be said to encode uh, positional information, so that especially the thresholds here, um, by reading the concentration of the morphogen, the cell some, somehow knows where it is in the tissue. So the, the, the gradient contains information for the cell to read and interpret um, by switching on differentiation genes, target genes. So the French flag is a classic sort of model of, of spatial pattern formation and the segmentation uh, gene network with its maternal gradients and the gap genes that were switched on later on was sort of a paradigmatic experimental confirmation of this uh, classical model. Of course, there's much more to the segmentation gene network. And luckily we have this absolutely beautiful Nobel Prize winning work by uh, Nestle Bolhard and Eric Wieschaus who performed the saturation mutagenesis screen um, and then um, classified the resulting mutants into these different um, uh, classes that we saw before, but also examined every single sort of mutual interactions between different genes. So we get a very complicated network that not only involves these sort of hierarchical interactions, but also uh, cross-regulatory interactions among gap genes, for example, and even auto-regulatory um, interactions uh, of the segmentation genes themselves. So we, we get a rather complicated network that creates a pattern. And this, of course, is already a big step forward uh, from this sort of simple explanation of genes as, as switches. Okay, so we could call this a genetic mechanism version 2.0, where uh, you are saying we have now a genetic regulatory network, or GRN, very popular now. Um, these genes, they interact together, and what's important are the interactions that determine the sort of pattern and the dynamics um, uh, of the process. This was. Uh, famously first suggested that development works like this by Britton and Davidson in 1969 in this absolutely fantastic pioneering science paper. I recommend you read it. And this is one of the figures where they, they, they tell us that development is basically to be explained as a sort of a, an electric uh, or electronic circuit would be. So this is a completely different type of explanation where the focus is no longer on the activity of single genes, but an activity that comes out of the organized sort of interactions between different factors. So, but still, all of this is based on genetics only. So what you do is you perturb a healthy system, you check what's going wrong, and then you try to sort of read out um, what the healthy system is supposed to be doing. So this is a reductionist approach, you're trying to decompose the system into its component factors. So you try to identify the, the different genes, come up with a parts list, so different genes, and then the interactions between them to reconstruct the network. Of course, this is a massively sort of uh, successful uh, research approach. The history of genetics is 100 years old now, 
uh, and well, if you go back to Mendel even more, and has been absolutely um, fantastically successful, but it has its limitations. So let's think about those limitations. One of them is that many genetic perturbations are lethal. Um, so they're lethal in a way that's not very interesting. Drosophila is a special case. The embryo doesn't grow while the segmentation process occurs in, in the flower beetle tribolium. Um, the embryo elongates while it's segmenting. And most of the mutations, or a lot of the mutations of segmentation genes simply have a growth defect. So if the embryo doesn't elongate, there is no segmentation, but that's not very interesting for reconstructing the network that creates the pattern, because you simply have no pattern. Not very informative. So we need informative mutants that have a specific effect on the process that you're studying. But many mutations, on the other hand, making things worse, do not have a phenotype, especially bad invertebrates with their genome duplications. So uh, about a 30%, at least, of the genes in mice do not show any detectable phenotype at all. But to assume that these genes don't do anything, that's premature. We don't know that. There's a lot of redundancy built into the system, and genetics really hits a limit when trying to decompose such redundant systems. Furthermore, many interesting developmental phenomena are not associated with any specific mutation. In the second example that I'll show you, um, I will have a specific um, case uh, point to make the point. Um, so it has been a little bit lost on us, not the classical embryologists, that not all phenomena we want to explain in development are genetically determined, okay? So we need to come back to that. Another really big problem is that if you've already gathered some, some experience in a lab, then you know that it's really difficult to interpret mutant expression patterns. Again, an example here from the gap genes in uh, Drosophila. Let's take a wild type embryo. Here's my simple depiction of it and the expression pattern of the gap gene Krupal in the middle. Remember that picture that I was showing you earlier. Krupal interacts with another gap gene called Hunchback, which is both maternally and zygotically expressed, which makes the genetics really complicated. And so if you mutate both the maternal and the zygotic contribution of hunchback, you will see that Krupal is uh, moving into the anterior of the embryo here. So it's expanding into the area where hunchback used to be expressed, I should say. It's expressed in the anterior of the embryo. So how do you interpret this? Okay, so you can do the reverse experiment. You can say, okay, I overexpress hunchback using a heat shock promoter. So now hunchback is everywhere. And in this case, you can see compared to the wild type, the anterior boundary of Krupal has been pushed back towards the posterior of the embryo. How would you interpret this? You would say, okay, hunchback is gone, more Krupal in the anterior, hunchback is overexpressed, less Krupal in the anterior, hunchback must be a repressor of Krupal. However, at the same time, in the hunchback mutant, Krupal gets a lot weaker. We can see that even with qualitative assays. And also, if you overexpress hunchback, Krupal expands very much to the posterior, where hunchback didn't used to be. Okay, so this indicates that hunchback, at the same time as being a repressor, is also an activator. Okay, what's going on? There are two possibilities we could imagine. One is that hunchback acts as a repressor at certain concentrations, but maybe as an activator at different concentrations. So, interpreting this, people have said hunchback acts as a repressor at high concentrations as an activator at low concentrations. Could be. But it could also be that we've forgotten a third factor. There is another transcription factor uh, encoded by the, the gap gene KNRPS, which is expressed just posterior of Krupal. And it is a repressor of Krupal, and at the same time, strongly repressed by Hunchback. You can see if Hunchback is gone, KNRPS expands all the way through the, the area where Krupal is expressed. Since KNRPS represses Krupal, Hunchback is gone, you de-repress a repressor, you get an activation. Double negative is a positive interaction. And consistent with this, if you overexpress hunchback, there's no KNRPS, which explains the posterior expansion of Krupal in this embryo. So basically, the activation could be indirect through the repression of a repressor. No, there is no way you can do genetics and molecular biology and get around this problem of not knowing exactly whether an interaction is direct or not. Molecular um, assays will show you whether uh, uh, Krupal, uh, KNRPS, and Hunchback bind to each other's binding regions, but they won't tell you whether they're activating or repressing. Okay, 
So to piece a whole system together again is very complicated, especially if you consider that there's more factors here. Uh, another gap gene, giant, and uh, uh, terminal gap genes that are also involved in the regulation of these genes. So, so the situation is, is much more complicated, even in this very simple system. The last problem with genetics is once you've sort of worked out doing a lot of genetics and molecular biology, you've worked out an entire network. So what I'm showing you here is a, a bit of a dated uh, sort of a picture from 2010, but it nevertheless gets the point across. It's a mapping of all the interactions between maternal coordinate genes, such as big, great, caudal, and then gap genes, giant, group of knurps, hunchback here, um, and, uh, and other factors. And you can see it's very complicated. So basically, you've done all the work, you've drawn the summary diagram of a network, and now you're supposed to tell me how this works, okay? It's very, very difficult to understand what this network actually does. It's much easier to reconstruct it, to get to this point, than it is to understand what this does. This is the grand challenge. So what we're having here is not an explanation in this sense, but the starting point, a challenge to understand what such a network is actually doing. These are all sort of uh, limitations that are uh, intrinsic to any reductionist approach. You're decomposing the system, you're localizing function, but the task is now to sort of put all this together again uh, and find out what it actually does. And one of my favorite philosophers of science, Gandalf from The Lord of the Rings, has put this beautifully to the point. He that breaks a thing to find out what it is has left. The path of wisdom, he says. The Saruman and where reductionism leads uh, can be seen in this beautiful illustration of Isengard uh, flooded by the ants. Um, it does not end well. So we cannot stop there. By just taking everything apart, we do not understand anything. That's the take home message here. So to put it slightly differently, this is how we understood sea urgen development in 1967. You have a beautiful sort of series of stages. We have uh, an understanding of certain cytoplasmic determinants that are um, localized and that lead to the segregation of different lineages, such as the micromeres here in red, that will go uh, and ingress into the embryo during gastrulation and then form um, the, the skeleton of the embryo, uh, the beautiful gluteus larva when it hatches here. So this is a sort of a, a, a a descriptive understanding of uh, development with a bit of a mechanistic understanding that there is something like these determinants that differentiates different areas of the embryo. This, of course, is how we understand sea urchin development. This is a picture that I downloaded in 2016, but it hasn't changed much since then. This is how we understand sea urchin development today. And you could argue that, you know, I mean, you have a gene regulatory network, the different boxes here. Uh, represent different tissues, different time points, and you have a lot of it interactions. You could argue that this isn't, in a sense, uh, progress, right? What we, we've abstracted away a, a lot of things, like the, the geometry, the cellular interactions, the sort of you know, complicated behavior of those micromeres ingressing, crawling into uh, the inner, uh, the blastocele of the embryo, and it's all gone, the tissue geometry, this sort of very proactive behavior of the cells, all of that is gone out, abstracted, idealized away uh, out of this model. So not only have we gained a lot of genetic knowledge, but we have lost some context. Um, and how can we put this together again? So I would say if you do this, this is not systems biology. So this, the, the, this sort of advance from uh, the action of single genes to networks hasn't really overcome reductionism at all. What it is, is doing reductionism at a genome-wide scale. So you look at all the factors involved, you map all of their detailed molecular interactions, you decompose the system, you, you localize functions, but you still don't know what the whole system does. And I would call this, uh, to quote uh, a dear colleague of mine, Yanni Hoffmeyer, I would call this system-wide biology, not systems biology. The difference between that and true systems biology is simple. Systems biology uh, worries about what this network does. But if you go to any sort of systems biology meeting, often what you get is, is you get a lot of these sort of network graphs thrown at you. They're called hairball graphs, just like something that your cat would puke up after eating a bird. 
And uh, people are impressed because they show, you know, the, the system is complex. You've done a lot of work to, to draw this graph. Fantastic. But it doesn't really tell you what the system does. And to do that, that's a really grand challenge. So let's take a very, 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 very simple network. Three genes indicated by, um, by different colored dots here and interactions between them. All of these genes are constitutively activated and uh, they are transcription factors that repress each other in the way that's depicted here. So you have uh, these sort of mutual uh, repressive interactions. And it has a funny name, this little circuit. It's called an AC-DC circuit. Uh, it was named like that by um, uh, James Briscoe and his group when they discovered and described the circuit, uh, the circuit in, 19, uh, in 2000, uh, 2012. And um, it's called AC-DC because it does uh, both uh, positive and negative feedback. So just like uh, the current AC-DC, uh, it does sort of steady switch uh, between the green and the red gene. If, if these interactions here are very strong, you have a double negative interaction. Remember, double negative is a positive. So this, this is a positive feedback loop. And because these two factors hate each other, you get an expression of either the green one or the red one, but never both at the same time. So it's like a switch, a toggle switch. While this uh, sort of second feedback loop here between the three genes, three negative interactions, that's a negative feedback loop, they can create oscillations, just like you have AC or DC current in an electric circuit. So a very simple circuit, but it can show many, many different behaviors. So it can switch, it can oscillate. So what you see here is the situation of the switch. Interestingly, it can uh, have a switch that's not stable. It goes back and forth, back and forth. This is called a relaxation oscillation. It can just create, if, if the interactions uh, in the negative feedback loop are stronger, it can create uh, oscillations that are damped, that are stopping after a while, or that are sustained, or stable oscillations. So you have at least four different qualitatively different behaviors that come out of the simple system. And I haven't even mentioned the most common and most typically observed behavior, and that is that all genes are just dying off and nothing happens at all. Okay, so five, in reality, uh, this simple circuit can exhibit five qualitatively different um, what are called behavioral regimes, completely qualitatively different types of behavior. And so imagine that if you want to understand this huge Eric Davidson network about the sea urgent, you need to understand how uh, this sort of behavior comes about, which is difficult for even such a small circuit. So this, figuring out what the, circuit, what the system does is, is, is true systems biology, in my opinion. So, to wrap up this lecture, we've come to a place where we have to introduce mechanism 3.0 if you want to have a causal, a mechanistic explanation of a developmental process. You need to do modeling, surprisingly, okay? And here is why. This is work by two philosophers, Bill Bechtel and Adele Abrams, Abramson, and uh, very, very interesting work. And it's about how do we explain things in biology, okay? And so they say we need to take into account the parts and operations of the mechanism. So the parts are the genes, the operations are their interactions. Their spatial organization, of course, if you have an embryo like the Drosophila embryo, you have to take into account where the interactions are happening and the pattern of change over time in properties of its parts and in operations. That's very important. So the interactions, the concentration of the, the different components changes over time. And so the interactions will change over time and you need to track that as well. And that results in the orchestrated behavior of the mechanism. So how do you track those spatio-temporal interactions? Um, you need mathematical modeling and dynamical systems theory for this. So not just any mathematical model, but you need a model that tracks all these different interactions happening at the same time in different um, locations at different times. Okay, You cannot do this in your head as soon as the system is a, a above a certain complexity. So you don't need to model it. The system is very simple, but in the case of the gap genes here, uh, we've seen that it's very hard to track all the, the uh, interactions at the same time. And they say such modeling provides understanding beyond that which is available from identifying the parts, operations, and organization of the mechanism. So decomposition and mentally rehearsing its function. So your ability to mentally rehearse the functioning 
of a mechanism is extremely limited, in other words. And you need computational or mathematical modeling to help you with it. So here's a basic recipe for what they call dynamic mechanistic explanation. You need to do all the decomposition. You need first the parts and their interactions. You need to draw this hairball. You need to reconstruct that. But, uh, and that's very important, that's just the first step. After decomposing the system, you need to recompose it again. So you need dynamical systems modeling, which is not in itself a sort of a causal mechanistic um, explanation. A model without evidence is not an explanation, but a model combined in this way with mechanistic decomposition amounts to a, an explanation, a mechanistic explanation of the system. And this is the last point I'm going to make. So the, the sort of, you know, um, reductionist perturbation approach like genetics will never give you sufficient explanation. So it, you will never be sure whether the parts that you've assembled are sufficient to explain the behavior of the system. They are necessary. You've knocked them out in a mutagenesis screen. You've targeted them by reversing uh, genetics. Whatever you do, you know they're necessary, but they're not sufficient. You need the mathematical model to get a sufficient explanation. So if you want a mechanistic explanation of a developmental process counterintuitively, you not only need to let Humpty Dumpty fall off the wall, but you need, and that's the much more difficult task, to put Humpty Dumpty together again and see if the interactions actually do what you think they're doing. To summarize this part of the lecture, I told you that development provides a mapping between genotype and phenotype. Fair enough. Developmental processes can be represented by interacting dynamic regulatory networks. That's how we like to uh, represent them. The components and interactions represented by the network implement a developmental mechanism. So different components, their activities, and their organized uh, joint behavior. And these mechanisms are too complex for us to decipher just by mental simulation or rehearsal, and we need computer models to understand. Very simple. So I'll provide two examples in the next two um, lectures that illustrate these points. So if you have any questions, comments, uh, please email, and you can follow me on Twitter at this uh, Twitter, Twitter tag as well. Okay, I'll see you for the next lecture. Bye-bye.